He still spoke it to them. He still let them hear it, even though they weren't going to understand it. And this is something we should be mindful of because, you see, the Lord was leading by example. And the example was that he was being the watchman. He was being the watchman to Israel. Because, <clears throat> you see, the watchman's job was to be on the city walls and he was to be the lookout. And if there was any sign of danger whatsoever, he would have a big uh, stack of, of fire next to him. And the next thing that would be lit and he would sound the warning, sound the alarm. And I'm just going to be honest with you. The church has failed miserably in this. There's a weight of responsibility upon the church and I, I, I honestly don't see it anymore. I'm not on about this church, but I'm on about the church as in the body as a whole. I see us going down the roads of entertainment. I see churches being turned more or less into nightclubs and calling it worship. That's not being a watchman. You see, if the gospel isn't enough, then I'm sorry, people, we are doing something sorely wrong. Yeah. We are no longer in the will of God because it's this word that has won the souls of men and women right. over our hands. We must remember that. Even in Ezekiel 3 and 17, and I'm just going to re read these few verses about the watchman because I think it's important. It says, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say unto the wicked, thou so surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speaketh to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity but his blood will I require at thy hand. Yet if I warn the wicked and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Again, when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. Because thou hast not given him warning, he shall die in his sin, and his righteousness which he had done shall not be remembered, but his blood will I require at thy hand. Nevertheless, if I warn that righteous man that the righteous sin not, and he doth not sin, he shall surely live, because he is warned also thou hast delivered thy soul. That's an awesome responsibility for a church, for a pulpit. And I think people that preach the gospel should be mindful of those verses whenever they climb into a pulpit. They should never take it lightly. It's the message of God, and I think that has been lost so, so much when I, I even see the TV evangelism and all that. It seems so flippantly sad. You know, trying to, trying to just bring people in with worldly things. Come on. This can't be. This wasn't like it was when the Lord walked the earth. He was our great example. He said things that were hard to hear. Hard to hear. But they were the truth. Do you know what he was doing? He was doing it in love. And somebody will tell you the truth because they love you. So we have to remember that. So if we look at our verse <clears throat> in Luke 8 and 16, we see a few things here that the Lord gives us. A, there's, a, there's a candle and he talks about a vessel being it covered up with a vessel or put under a bed. But to really get into this verse, I always like to have a look at the start of the chapter or 
We'll read a few verses back because we start to get a context of what the Lord is talking about. And you see, if you go further into to Luke chapter 8, in fact, if you go from the start, you start reading down from verse 1 to 9, you, you, you find that there's actually, this follows on from the parable of the sower. Now, I'm sure you're all familiar with the parable of the sower. So the farmer is, 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 is throwing the seed out there. And the Lord explains to us that this is the word of God. The seed is the word of God, and there are different types of soil. So just to recap, because it's important what different types of soil is. The soil is how the people respond to the word of God. That's what it is. So you have the wayside soil where the fowls of the air come and de devour it. And the fowls of the air were it was when the devil came in and snatched the word out of people's hearts. When they started listening to that old liar. Then two was the rocky ground where it withered away. There was no roots, there was no foundation for them to grow in. Then there was the thorny ground where it was choked. And those were people who let the cares of this life just come in and rob them of it. And then finally you had the good ground. And this was an honest and good heart that was to hear the word of the Lord and they would then receive it. So you'll notice he is making this very clear to the hearts that will receive it. He's making this parable very clear to them. Now if you would turn over to Mark 4 and 21. Now this is the same sort of verse, but I want to show you something here. <clears throat> And it says in this verse, it says, And he said unto them, Is a candle brought to be put under a bushel? Now that word brought there is a Greek word. Ek, ek homia. And it means to come from a place and to another place. But listen to this. It's used of a person arriving. That's what the context of it is. It's a person actually arriving and to become known onto a house or a home. That's the context of the Greek there. So, so the light is a person. Now we all know that the light of the world, as in John 8 and 12 said, that then Jesus spake, or then spake Jesus again unto them saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So we know that the Lord Jesus Christ is the light. He's the light here. So we have this parable saying this light is coming onto a house. Now at first glance we may miss this, but it's actually quite important because there's two applications for this parable of this light coming onto a house. The first one is a national aspect yes. that we look at. And then the second one will be a personal aspect onto people. And I'm hoping just to show you uh, both this morning and maybe just to give you something that you've probably never seen or maybe haven't seen in the parables before. But you'll find that usually these parables have a national aspect to them. So as I say, this is a person coming onto the house. So you say, right, we know who the person is. So who is the house? Well, that house was the house of Israel. And he was the light coming back in onto them. So now we need to get back into a bit of history for this. Now you'll know in the, whole, uh, in the Old Testament at around... 930 BC, at the death of King Solomon, the house of Israel then divided into two houses. So you had the, the northern ten tribes of Israel under Jeroboam with its cap, capital Samaria, and then you had the southern house of Judah under Rehoboam, and this was the son of King Solomon. And you find all this in 1 Kings in chapter 12. But you'll notice something. They were both taken away because of their disobedience unto God. So the northern ten tribes were taken away captive into a, 
the Assyrians, the southern two tribes were later then taken away captive by the Babylonians. But there was a remnant of the southern tribes that came back. There was a rather remnant of the southern half of Judah that returned to Jerusalem under Zerubbabel, Nehemiah. You read all this. But the one thing we have to remember is that when they divided, and people always think, well, when they divided, they get this idea that it was a clean split. It wasn't. There was even in Judah, there was a remnant of the ten tribes, even in Judah. And the, and the same it would have been in, in the northern house. You know, so it wasn't as, as clear cut as we think. You know, obviously people come and, come and go from place to place. They move about. So if you turn to Jeremiah 31, we'll see the aspect of the covenant that the Lord is going to make with the house of Israel. Jeremiah 31, verse 31. says this behold the days come saith the Lord that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt which my covenant they break although I was a husband unto them saith the Lord but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. So what does this verse mean? God made a covenant with Israel, the Israelites in the wilderness, at the foot of Mount Sinai. But it was a marriage ceremony. You see, God was to be the bridegroom and the bride was the Israelite people. There was a marriage ceremony there and just as the bride says, I do, they agreed to let God be the husband, the head of their house. So Israel then claimed that they would do all of what God had commanded them to do during this ceremony. So God becomes the husband. As he becomes the husband, he becomes their protector. He protects them in times of war. He would provide for them with the seasons where the crops would then be abundant. He would love them. He would care for them. He would have his hand upon them. Just as a good husband would do to his wife. But the Israelites became an adulteress in the sight of God. They went after other idols. They wouldn't do the commands of God. And if you would like to turn to Jeremiah 3 and 8, we see what happens. <clears throat> and it says, And I saw, and I saw when all the cause whereby backslide in Israel committed adultery I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not but went and played the harlot also so God divorced Israel he put them away this meant they were taken away from the promised land and the northern house of Israel were, were taken captive by the ancient Assyrians and they were placed by the river Gozan in the city of the Medes. So they were taken away. And then eventually, they migrated after time over into Europe, to Britain and America. And this is where, when they initially went and migrated, they went through what they call the Denial Pass, or is it what's commonly known as the Israelite Pass. 
And these were a mountain range called the Caucasus or the Caucasus Mountains. And this is actually where we get the name Caucasian from. So you see them, they all pass through. So how has God got to restore his people after all this has happened? How has God got to restore them? So if God divorced his people, how could he get them back? Well, he was going to make a new covenant with them. But this time he would write it in their hearts, not on stone. He was going to make a new covenant. But there was only one way that a divorced woman could ever be remarried. And that was at the death of her husband. You see, at the shedding of his blood, there is so much that happened on that cross. I don't think this side of eternity will ever plumb the depths of what that transaction took place that day. Not only did he die for the sin of the whole world, he died for the whosoever will. Not only did he die that man and woman may be put back in a place of dominion and have victory over the devil. Not only did he die to make us kings and priests and heirs to the kingdom and have everlasting life. Not only did he do that, but he also died to bring the house of Israel back into a bond of new covenant with him. And there was a reason for this. There was a reason for this. Well, you say, well, you may say to me, well, brother, what does this have to do with the candle and the bed, Mark 4 and 21? Well, if you want to turn to Matthew 15 and 22, and this is from the Lord's own mouth, and you'll see what he says. It says this, and, above, and behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And that's what the Lord said. I didn't say that. He said that. So straight away there, now we know obviously he did help the woman, but straight away there, we can see that he's got a purpose and a plan. Secondly, if you look into Mark 4 and 21 and Luke 8 and 16, you will actually find that in Mark 1 and verse 39, it tells you where he is at the time of giving these parables. And he's preaching throughout all of Galilee. Now you see Galilee, it was a despised area. Nobody liked Galilee. <laughs> you know, as far as they was concerned, the Galileans were considered unlearned, ignorant people. They were considered violent and nothing but trouble. But you see, in the region of Galilee, where the Lord did this preaching and was expounding the kingdom, it was just south of a place called Samaria. So this was the region where actually the northern house was originally. He knew that there was a remnant still of the house of Israel in this region. And that's why 11 out of the 12 disciples were from Galilee. That's where they were from. So this is no coincidence. So if you like to put a summary on this verse, that no man, when he had lighted the candle, in Luke 8 and 16, no man, when he had lighted the candle, cover it with a vessel or put it under a bed, but setteth it on a candlestick, that they which enter in may see the light. Why was it so important for him to go unto the house of Israel? 
Why was it? Well, he knew that by going to the remnant of the Israelites, that they were going to put the light in its rightful place. He knew that. You see, like any good farmer, he knew where the good ground was going to be. And that's where he was going to sow. Just as the apostle, if you have a look in the scriptures, was instructed by the Holy Spirit to go west and to preach the gospel. Why was this? Well, in James 1 and 1, it says, James, the servant of God, and the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. Paul went west to reach the other tribes of Israel. And by doing this, they would then hear the word of God at seed. And they would be instrumental. And the instrument that God would use to spread the gospel all over the world. Now, I don't know what about you, but that gives me hope. Because I tell you why. God took this backslidden, rebellious people. I mean, they were a mess when you read about them. And he was able to take the biggest mess and turn them into the greatest message. The message of the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they went throughout the whole of the world. And even in the Western nations today, the missionaries' endeavors that have gone forth from here to reach the lost all over the world. Even when you look at the outpourings of the Holy Spirit, Topeka, Kansas, and in, uh, in America, and our own here in Britain, the Welsh Revival, even with the Wesley brothers, when they're on the verge of revolution, God poured out his spirit mightily. And the light of the gospel shine across the world. Brother and sister, I just want to tell you. That was a, the national message. But there's also always a personal message with Jesus Christ. Because he's personal to each and every one of us. He's a people person. And he invests in each and every one of us. And I want you to get this. You see that light that is presented. Do we accept it? I'm just being honest. You see when we're up in the pulpit and we seem to be throwing out the word and the scriptures. Do we take it? Do we accept it? There's many a times I've sat there and maybe Pastor Ken doesn't even know this, but there's many a times I've sat there and Pastor Ken has been preaching on something I think... You know what, I, I used to think to myself, that's for this other person, but if only they could hear it now because they're not here. And then the Lord would turn around and say, well, you're here, they're not. <laughs> and it's true. It was for me. You have to accept it sometimes. Because it's the Lord's goodness that he's challenging you to mould you and shape you into a vessel that's got to be beautiful in his sight. It's what he wants to do. So do we receive it? Another thing is, do we receive the word? We're privileged, even in this ministry, in this church. Because I tell you something, there's not every church that the Lord would speak in. I mean it. Do we receive the word of the Lord when the Spirit speaks? Or do we just think, well, that's just a person going off again? It's the word of God. He's speaking onto us. Because he wants to give us instruction. And he wants to build us up in our most holy faith. And the other thing is, what position do we put it? What position does the word take place with us? I mean, do we cover the light? With a vessel of fear? Do we believe the lies of the old devil? 
when he starts coming in and say, you'll never be anything. You'll never do this. You'll never be able to do that. Well, let me tell you something else. You want to flip that back round, brother, sister, because I tell you, he's a liar. Amen. It's the complete opposite. You will do it. You will overcome. Because you're mighty through Christ who's in you. Amen. Don't let the devil ever rob you of the light that the Lord has put in you. Or do we place it under the bed of comfort? Are we too comfortable where we are? Maybe we think if we really let our light shine, if we really started to show Christ in our lives, will we lose our comfort? Will we lose our material wealth even? And we can see that even throughout the churches today. That's what they're worried about. And that's why they compromise on the gospel. But let me tell you something. You see that comfort, you see that material wealth. It will mean nothing when it comes down to eternity. It will mean nothing when it comes to before we go before the I am of God. You see, in this time that we live in, this darkened time, things are going to get darker. But our light's got to shine brighter. And I want to give you a verse that the Lord gave me when I was, wasn't long saved. It was Psalm 110 and verse 1. And it says this, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at the right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. I was one time sat in my study and I was thinking about how the world was going and I just so defeated. Nobody wants to know the gospel. Nobody's interested. And I stumbled across this verse and you know what I was surprised about? I started to look through the New Testament. It was in the New Testament over 20 times. I started to look at this verse and I said, wow, Lord, I see it now. God's people are going to arise and the world's in for a shock. The Spirit of God is going to move through this land. And let me tell you, brother and sister, like never before, that God is never left for a witness. And let me tell you something, there has got to be a move of the Spirit of God like this world has never, never seen. So I'm telling you now, brothers and sisters, we need to get ready. We need to prepare ourselves for what the Lord wants to do. Because even though things are getting bad, just like it was with the house of Israel, things just seem to be at a place where there couldn't be nothing done with them anymore. They were completely corrupted. This world seems completely corrupted. Although the Lord has completely lost the grip on them. No, he hasn't. He's got a plan and a purpose. Just like when Gideon come up with all them soldiers, then he? he said, son, you know what? You've got too many. I'm going to show you the hand of the Lord and that's what he's going to do. The hand of the Lord is upon us and we need to let our light shine like never before. Get it from under that vessel, get it from under that bed and say, the Lord is my God and I can do all things through him. You see that thing that's been holding you back, break it off and say, Jesus Christ is my saviour and who the sun sets free is free indeed and I'm free in him. Brother and sister, don't be under bondage. Don't be discouraged this morning. The Lord thy God has his hand upon you. And I want to give you one last verse before I finish. People say to me all the time, well, we live in the Laodicean age. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. But there's a beautiful promise in that. Listen to this. Revelation 3, verse 21. To him that overcome will I grant to sit with me in my throne even as I also overcame and sat down with my father in his throne. Isn't that beautiful? You see, if we overcome, we overcome this lady seeing age, we overcome this lukewarmness, if we continue to preach the gospel, if we continue to witness for his glory, we get to sit with him in the throne of God. Isn't that amazing? Doesn't that just thrill your heart this morning? The Lord thy God wants to do that for you. Brother and sister, we can do this. And we're not going to do it on our own strength. But we'll do it through his. I hope that's encouraged you this morning.
and bless you. And look, thank you for listening. God bless you.